and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man looking at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away, and presently he forgets what kind of man he is. But he who has looked carefully into the perfect law of liberty and has remained in it, not becoming a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, he shall be blessed in his deed. And if anyone thinks himself to be religious, not restraining his tongue, but deceiving his own heart, that man's religion is vain. Religion pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their tribulation and to keep oneself unspotted from this world. And the Holy Gospel is taken from St. John. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. At, uh, at that time, Jesus said to his disciples, Amen, amen, I say to you. If you ask the Father anything in my name, he will give it to you. Hitherto you have not asked anything in my name. Ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. These things I have spoken to you in parables. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in parables, but will speak to you plainly of the Father. In that day you shall ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. His disciples said to him, Behold, now thou speakest plainly and utterest no parable. Now we know that thou knowest all things and dost not need that anyone should question thee. For this reason we believe that thou camest forth from God. Thus, for this Sunday's Holy Gospel. My beloved people, there are some items in the bulletin that I wish to bring to your attention. Today, of course, tomorrow is a national holiday. It is a memorial day. Let us try to remember all men who have died in the service of their fatherland, whoever they may be, and who have died honestly for an honest cause in their fatherland. Let us pray for these men. There will be catechism class after this mass this morning. Thursday of this week is Ascension Thursday, and it is a holy day of obligation. The masses in this church will be at 6 and 8 and 7 p.m. The day before, Ash, uh, the day before uh, Ascension Thursday is not a day of fast and abstinence, and neither are the three rogation days beginning tomorrow days of fast and abstinence. We will have litany, the litany of the saints and procession outside of the church uh, these next three days, weather permitting, of course, uh, Rogation Day uh, procession and litany, litanies, the, great, the greater litanies. Um, everyone should be reminded that uh, of uh, the, the, the matter concerning Easter duty. The Easter duty asks that we go to confession and receive Holy Communion during this Easter time. We are in Easter time at the present time, and it will be over at Trinity Sunday. That's the Sunday after Pentecost. So if you have not been to confession and have not, and, and have not received Holy Communion, or even have received Holy Communion but have not gone to confession, 
you need and you should go to confession before Trinity Sunday. The Corpus Christi ceremonies, the ministers for that particular occasion are listed in the bulletin. And again, I, even though it's stated in the bulletin, I state it here. If anyone is not able to fill his assignment for that day, uh, please let me know about it right away so that I can find a, a replacement for you. There is something that I think I really need to bring to your attention, something that I don't like to do uh, from the pulpit anyway, but um, uh, I, I feel reasonably sure that many of you, if not all of you, have uh, already heard of or have learned about some new ecclesiastical regulation that is in the making concerning uh, the giving of the right to every priest to say the Tridentine Mass. Um, this is not yet uh, in effect. It's supposed to be in effect the latter part of the year. My beloved people, on the surface, this sounds like it is absolutely wonderful. But for heaven's sake, think before you come to any conclusion. This could be the final step to produce utter confusion. How many priests today of the age bracket which they're in for that matter, have ever seen a Tridentine Mass? How many priests today have ever been trained in the Tridentine Rite? How many priests today, bishops too for that matter, are willing and truly down last line willing to reinstitute the Tridentine Mass in their churches? And as a consequence, when the people go to these masses, the nine o'clock mass was a circus mass, the 11 o'clock mass is a serious mass. You know, um, it is time to be perspicacious and think it out. So my beloved people, it is time for prayer more than ever. Uh, I. I'm not that well informed yet about it. It is only on the surface information that has come to us around. It's been published in the papers, actually. And so let us be very, very, very cautious of what we are about. People will go back to these because, uh, some people will go back because they will hear the Latin language. And their devotion to the Latin is more than their devotion to the faith. Any statement uh, 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 quoted in Latin is, does not make the statement true. It can be just as false in Latin as it would be in Egyptian or Chinese or any other language that you might wish to quote it in. So my beloved people, it is time forever and ever for more prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Now that that's said, we can go on. In today's epistle, the first line of St. James's epistle, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For the time to come, but I don't know how long, however long it takes actually, we are going to be talking a little bit more intently and intensely on prayer. Many of us are certainly people who involve ourselves in prayers, plural. 
But we have in here and in our bulletins have tried to teach that it is not in the volume of prayers that we recite each day. It is not in the number of masses that we attend each day or the number of rosaries that we uh, recite each day or whatever. It's not that in all. Are we people of prayer? There is a difference, and the difference is vast. If we go to the catechism, the catechism asks, what is prayer? And the answer is given, uh, prayer is the lifting up of one's mind and heart and soul to God. That's good. And the catechism in giving that answer has done its work. But it does make it uh, sound as though you get on some kind of an elevator and you are lifted up to God when you pray. That's not quite right. Now, do you know that every one of you, as well as every one of us, and as you also know, or should know by now, because you've been told often enough that the only difference between you and us is that we have bound ourselves by vow to do the same thing that you have to do. But do you know or did you know that every one of you is called upon to be a mystic? That every one of us is called upon to be a mystic? You say right away, oh my, that's ridiculous. I'm not a mystic. I have no, no calling to be a mystic. I don't know even what you're talking about, being a mystic. Because we have um, taken upon, uh, we have given rather to the definition of mystic, someone who is having apparitions, who is levitating, uh, who has got all kinds of Oh, mercy, just floating always, always and always. And you can see sanctity flowing from the mystic. That's wrong. Now, I'm not saying that this does not happen to mystics. And it does happen. It has happened. But nevertheless, the true definition of a mystic is this. And that is that a mystic seeks union with God. It's as simple as that. But here we come in our sophistications and we have to give to this a definition that doesn't belong there. Every one of you and every one of us has been asked to, uh, to, 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 to seek union with God. And how is this union accomplished? By prayer. What do we mean by prayer? Do we mean, the, you, as I said earlier, a multiplication of prayers, the multiplication of, of spiritual reading, and so on. And we know ourselves, my beloved people, that we can, for example, come into a place like this and be raised to the seventh heaven inside here by the lovely prayers that we say, and then step right outside the front door 
and start the program of criticizing, of stabbing, of backbiting, of feeling better than the next man. You see, the person who prays, prays in the, the plural much, it is not beyond that person to look at his neighbor who perhaps does not pray as much as he prays and consequently looks upon himself a cut above the person who does not pray as much as he. And in his pride, not only does he set himself up on a pedestal, but in his pride, he, de he digs the hole, the pride digs even deeper and deeper and deeper. And the proud man's prayer never, never, never reaches the ear of God. We said in a bulletin a couple of weeks ago, and we're going to repeat it from time to time, that we are living right now in critical times. The times are so critical, my beloved people, and we are so, the thing that's, that's terrible about it is that we have become so accustomed to the critical nature of things that we no longer consider them as significant or important. It's like when you walk into a room, when you walk into this church, to be more specific, and we have burned a little incense to get rid of the damp odors or whatever, and to put some kind of uh, a nice smell in the house, when you first walk into the church, you notice the smell or the odor, do you not? Well, you've been in the church now for a little while. Do you still notice that smell? It's not quite there anymore. You, you become accustomed to it. And you lose it. And you lose it. And so it is with us. We have become so accustomed to the critical nature of things, and the critical nature of things has entered into absolutely every phase of our lives. And we've become accustomed to it. All we have to do is to turn on the TV set today and that we can find ourselves looking at something and thinking nothing of it that some years ago we would have been horror struck had we seen something even less than that on the scene. I remember when I was in high school that a certain book was forbidden even by non-Catholic sources that a certain book was forbidden. No, 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 you may not read that book because in that book there was one single word that was inappropriate. And most of you know what that book was or is. A good book too, I read it. Not because I was trying to be rebellious, but I read it. My beloved people, we have become accustomed to the critical nature of the situation. And therefore, we don't think that much of it. But the critical nature of that, of that situation is so bad that each one of us is required to take critical action. And critical action means that we put into effect in our lives the doing of what God wants of us. 
May I dig digress slightly, but it's still somewhat at least indicative of what we have by degrees, a little at a time, become accustomed to. If you, and I think you ought to, if you pick up sacred scripture in the Old Testament and go to the book of Exodus, in the neighborhood of chapter 20, something along in there, I don't know the exact quotation, and read it carefully, and read the description of the arrangement of the Ark of the Covenant that God himself demanded and instructed that they must do. You will be amazed at that description. You have never ever read anything equal to it in utter magnificence and stupendous beauty. And the regulations around the use of that particular instrument were pretty stupendous too. And that was for an instrument, an enclosure to house just some collectibles, important collectibles, of course, but no less collectibles. Collectibles, things that had been handed down to them at that time by God himself. Important, but collectibles. Let's keep that word collectible in mind. Now let us look at where we've gone and how we have degenerated and how we can sit blissfully by and say nothing of the degeneration of it all. We too have an Ark of the Covenant, don't we? not quite as sophisticated as what you shall read. We call it a tabernacle. And in that tabernacle is nothing collectible. Inside that tabernacle, we find enclosed and in prison, as I said, not a collectible, but the very body of the second person of the Blessed Trinity. Not in significance, but in actual fact. That's what's contained in that little cubicle. Now, in the last several years, in the lifetime of most of us in here today, right now, we have seen that tabernacle reduced to a level of importance that I dare say a greater degree of importance is given to a beer cooler than to that Holy of Holies. And we do not consider these times critical. In the Ark of the Covenant, once so, ever so often, I don't know how long it, it what the interval, space interval was, 
a given individual could go into the Ark of the Covenant to off, down into the Holy of Holies to offer sacrifice. Did you know that a rope was tied onto the foot or one of the feet of that individual? So that if it should happen that he would have a heart attack or whatever, drop over dead or something happened to him while he was in there, even there, nobody, did you hear the word? Nobody could go in there to fetch him. And so a rope was tied onto his foot to drag him out. In our Ark of the Covenant today, anybody wearing shoes, I think, has the liberty to go and stick hands in there and handle the very body of Jesus Christ. And we are not worried about the critical nature of these days. Therefore, we're going to hear a good deal about prayer. If we sometimes we think ourselves unimportant because we're so small. I will tell you something that I tell the sisters. There's only two sisters that we have so far by God's will, God's pleasure. And yet those two ladies, consecrated ladies, are a community. And being a community, those two ladies, in the eyes of God, not in the eyes of man, have as much strength and power in prayer as does any community elsewhere of greater numbers. Because God does not measure as we measure. And the genuine sincerity that comes out of such a community is what he's looking for. And that's what he's looking for in us. And every one of your homes Provided, of course, with the right intention, the right intention, I repeat it a third time, the right intention and disposition and commitment and determination being there, your home is no less a cloistered place than is this place right here as such by your prayer. And that's a big mouthful, isn't it? And being so, you have the power, whether you believe it or not, we have the power to hold the hand of God. But the unfortunate part of it all is that we do not ourselves appreciate the strength of our power. But the strength, that strength comes not from the multitude of the things that we have to say or that we want to say, but it comes entirely, entirely, dearest, dearest people, it comes entirely on our ability to change our interior selves. Always the word comes up, conversio, until that turning takes place 
in our lives, it is all a waste of time. Now you may take that or you may leave it. But the finding out of the true answer to that question, the answer to that question rather will be given when it is too late for us to do anything about it. Are we supposed to be that much different from the people we deal with outside? No. All we have to do, as has been told us, I've got to quit because it's time. All we have to do, as has been told us at other times, is take the steps to go to a little house that is called Nazareth. And let us lift up our knuckles hand and knock on that door. That's all. It's as simple as that. In that house, you're going to find, we are going to find, inside that house, absolutely everything that we need in this life. My beloved people, the times are critical and they require critical activity. And we're all called upon to be saints. And it's no, there's no such thing as a half saint because that half saint is not powerful enough to do the job. We're all sinners. I have not said, I have not said we're not sinners. We all continue to be sinners, but we must struggle with all of our strength and all of our might to fight that. And that requires critical activity. In so doing, we can bring about change outside. My beloved people.